Well, welcome back to ESG Square. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome uh, Rene Carriol to the ESG Square here in Luxembourg. Rene is joining us from London, and he's going to be giving us a great uh, international flair, uh, I think, to, uh, to this episode. Rene has had a long, distinguished career from PepsiCo, Time, uh, Inspired Networks. He's a professor at CAS, uh, and now also in Medallia. But instead of me butchering it, Rene, how about uh, I let you provide a much better introduction to yourself, please. So look, it's, it's a real privilege to be here from London. I've spent my, the last 20 years of my career as an executive coach, the accidental executive coach. So my clients are all chief executives, multinational companies, FTSE 100 companies, Fortune 500. And it's the most Taxing job in the world, as you know, Nicola, it's the toughest job, but it's the best job in the world. But it's the only job in the whole business there's no training and development plan for. The day you're promoted to chief instead the day you're appointed, it's the first time you're going to fly the plane. I spend my time sitting in the cockpit waiting for the first appointment chief executive to walk in, and I spend the next 12 months in them ensuring the plane flies without any issues. Now, that gives me such an insight into contemporary leadership and how it's changing and how it's changing so quickly. And it's from that perspective, I'd like to talk to you today about ESG. Super. Well, we're definitely going to get onto that. But the accidental coach is something I want to, uh, to touch on then. So as you say, you're coaching uh, CEOs around the world with a strong focus on inclusivity and also ESG. Why? Why? How did you get into it then? Why do you continue to, to do it after, after all these years? Why is it important to you? It is important because um, I suppose you never know the power of inclusion until you've been excluded. And if I look at my early career, both in the UK and in America, it was always not quite believing you could. Looking up and never seeing anyone who looked quite like you. Going as fast as you could, as far as you could, but never quite believing that you could get into the leadership position. And I was lucky enough to break through, and I had that burden and responsibility of knowing there was talented people who looked like me, who sounded like me, who were desperate for a role model. Having the opportunity to coach those people who can make that happen is a hell of a privilege. It's a hell of a responsibility. And I like to think that through my coaching, I help them with their leadership, I help them with their inclusion, and I help them not just do the smart thing, but to do the right thing as well. That matters. It matters a lot. It sure does. And just here, talking to you, I think I'm getting a flavor for the kind of coaching you provide, which would be uh, quite direct and very good, I think. Um, so, look, can you talk me through a little bit about this? You've, you've coached a lot of CEOs, Fortune 500 companies. What have you learned from all of this? Do you know, I think the first thing is you never stop learning. The best of the best never stop learning. They always have an appetite to learn. And the only mistake is the one you don't learn from. And the, the people I've been privileged, the best people I've been privileged to coach are the ones who aren't afraid to make the mistakes, aren't afraid to own up to the mistakes, aren't afraid to learn from those mistakes. But it takes courage. What I've realized that you can delegate many things, but there are some things that only remain on the desk of the chief executive. And they're always the big, ugly, horrible, tough things. They remain the responsibility of the chief executive. Everything else can be delegated down, but there's some stuff that only the chief executive can do. And the question I always ask when I'm looking after chief executive is who cares for the carers? They care for everyone else. They've got to be there for everyone else. They wake up every single day thinking about everyone but themselves. And sometimes it can be a really lonely, isolating and tough job. And what I found my job to be is to give them a damn good listening to. To be fair, there for them at the weekends when it's been one of the toughest weeks you could ever imagine. Or sometimes being there for them late on the Sunday night because it's going to be the week from hell. But it's also having that wonderful, wonderful ability to share in the successes, to feel part of the team and to know that they are a force for good. And look, Leadership is, is tough and it needs to remain tough because the only people who, sh who should bear that burden of responsibility 
are those who can affect people's lives and their livelihoods for the better. So I like to think it's not easy. It shouldn't be easy. It's what separates from the, the good from the great. And I've been privileged to work with some fantastic people. But I suppose the message I take away more than any other is that if you're given that responsibility, take it really seriously. It's a tough job. It's also a brilliant job. I think you've described it very well. Um, so thank you for that. And you've spoken about courage, humility, ability to learn, learn from your mistakes, make mistakes. If, if we move now into the specifics around inclusivity and ESG, right, and driving those two agendas, which can be one, right, because the inclusivity bit can fit under the S. So let's, let's talk about ESG. What, what makes um, a company successful in this area or a CEO successful in this area in, in your experience? You know, it starts with authenticity. It starts and ends with authenticity. It's got to be real. You can't manufacture it. You can't fake it. You can't imitate it. Otherwise, you'll be found out very, very quickly. It starts from wanting to do the right thing. But after a while, you soon realize it's also the smart thing. That in everything I've done over the last 10 years, we've seen that those who really want to make a tangible difference, be it sustainability, be it climate change, be it inclusion, you soon realize you've got to invest. It's not cheap. It might even be expensive to start with. And Maybe you don't see the tangible financial return on investment, but we think we change ROI to return on inclusion. If you keep pushing, if you keep doing the right thing, then the good stuff starts to flow. And it's not a dream, it's real. But in the early days, the investment can be really high. The returns can be really difficult. But if we look at some of the real role models, those who've been doing this a long time, if I look at the Unilevers, I look at the Nestle's, I look at those, and then if we look at some of the financial services business, if we look at BlackRock, we look at Goldman Sachs, they wouldn't be doing this unless there was a real return. And the return, the combination of doing the right thing and the smart thing is overpowering. But in the early days, it takes some really strong visionary leadership to push, especially when so many are pushing and aren't seeing the returns. And especially when the cost of capital, the cost of the investment may be really high and the returns not so high to start with. Where I've, I think I've been challenged most is keeping the leaders going when the returns, the financial returns are being challenged by some of their executive colleagues or their board of directors or some of the investors. This is a long-term gain. It's not about short-term gain. It's about long-term reputation and it's about legacy for the business. So thank you very much for that. You mentioned a few sort of leaders in the area, uh, Unilever in your experience, Unilever, BlackRock, Goldman, as these were, were standing out. You've also mentioned other firms where uh, either the board or other Exco members were challenging the, the financials uh, around this and why should we do it at all? And maybe I'm going to move into the second category, which is could you take me through, like, what is some of the challenges that you've received in this area that you've helped coach people through? Because our audience might, might be facing exactly that. So could you take us through maybe a challenge that you've you faced here and how you helped coach them through? Yeah. An internal one, an external one, and an external one. Where performance is tight. The markets aren't doing brilliantly. And around the executive team with the chief executive, there's a few big choices, a few big bets to be made. Where do we put our limited investment this year? And the voice of ESG is a new one, a relatively new one. It's a relatively unproven one. And there's the investment in technology, the investment in digital, the investment in bricks and mortar, the investment in growth, the investment in people. Now, that's a lot of tough things to contend with. And sometimes the arguments about ESG may not be fully formed. And it needs some courage. It needs some vision. And what I find, well, where I help with, is I tend to be the external voice of independence. And through my client base, I'm able to introduce other companies, other people who may be a few chapters ahead in the ESG book, the ESG manual, and come and share the journey they've been on and where they've got to. And it's an area where, on occasion, it feels really competitive, but there are many parts of it that aren't competitive. So I have 
I've had companies talk into each other. We introduced Google to HSBC, where Google came in to share with HSBC what they've done. And we found there was a non-competitive spirit there. And that worked brilliantly. And I'm always looking to introduce some of my clients to each other so they can learn from each other, they can cross-fertilize. And I think this is one area where the more companies we get investing in ESG, the planet wins. Everybody wins. So why wouldn't you? Then if I take a more external point of view, where we've got shareholders challenging whether, why is this the priority today? Why is it we're spending, investing in these areas today? And yet what we feel, and this is where I felt so strongly, there is a generation of customers, there's a generation of colleagues, a younger generation, which care about society, and they're more outspoken. They're quite prepared to be assertive, and they're influencers. And they're prepared to take on the chief executive. They're prepared to make their voices heard externally and internally. And Having sessions where I brought a younger generation of the workforce, of customers, in to meet the, those in the C-suite, it's been extremely productive. Because unlike my generation and those of my vintage, they're not as polite. They're not prepared to be as deferential. They're prepared to be brutally honest about the world they want to live in. And in most, care, most areas, they are the next generation of consumer or customer. Now, we understand when that's Netflix, we understand when it's Nike, but it's just as powerful for a bank, just as powerful for the asset managers, just as powerful for the pharmaceutical industry. You've given me a great idea as what to do in uh, our, our next board meeting here, which is to bring in that younger generation and have them uh, give us a word or two. Though we were talking about our kids at the beginning uh, or before this all started, and I think they're, they are quite blunt. And to your point, they need the purpose. They need to understand, and they do challenge authority much more than you know, future generations in the past. Uh, and that's a positive. And so I think, to your point here, firms need to really uh, own and believe and deliver on the ESG, and it can't just be a marketing ploy either. And I'd, I'd, I'd add to that that the best leaders today are the best listeners. The best communicators are the best listeners. And... There is a generation that's prepared to be vocal. And if you don't listen, they are also promiscuous. They are not afraid to take their loyalty elsewhere immediately. So let's, let's move on to that. Looking forward then, the next five years, wh where do you see the challenges and the opportunities in, in ESG for corporations? So it's, it's a tough one, but an, an, an optimistic view. It's, there's, there's a lot of research coming out at the moment saying that ESG, yes, we get it now. It's the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. But let's have a look at financial returns. At the end of the day, we're running businesses, and there'll come a time when the financial returns, because of all the people piling to, will, it, will they be as progressive? Will they be as positive? But I take a very different view. The business of business is no longer just business, and it never will be again. I think where purpose meets profits is here to stay forever. They are no longer uncomfortable bedfellows. We can deliver profits and we can deliver purpose, and they sit beautifully together. And in the next five years, I see a world where if you're not doing both together, you're going to have challenges. We used to say many years ago, we used to say that if you're in the public sector, you were values-led but perhaps not performance-driven. And if you're in the private sector, maybe you were performance-driven and not values-led. I think it doesn't matter where you are today. You have to deliver both, and you can. And I think we're going to deliver for our shareholders whilst we deliver for the planet. The question I would ask is, why wouldn't you? Yeah, I think we need to align purpose, values, profits, everything. Um, and we all have to do it for the, the sake of the planet, frankly. Um, so there's no turning back in that. And the routes to doing it, Nicola, are becoming increasingly clear, increasingly well-trodden, and I think what we're seeing is some fabulous role models. But no one is so far ahead that they're perfect. No one's cracked it totally. So we're all on this learning curve. It's a steep one. It's a fast one. But I've never felt anything more positive. Rene, I think that's a very uh, powerful message. And um, thank you so much for that. You know, and I would agree with all of, uh, all of what you've mentioned which is, it is a journey. We've been talking about this as a journey. We have many routes and many paths. 
we're still exploring all the right ways. I don't think we know all the solutions today that will get us to where we need to get to in the next 20 years in terms of technology and other things. But what I liked is what you brought about um, the, the learning sharing, bringing Google into CHSBC, uh, you know, to learn from each other. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here in ESG as well, which is to learn from one another, to introduce experts to each other, uh, and so to have that conversation, because I really do believe that together we'll be better and we'll figure it out. Thank you so much. I do want to give you the last sort of 30 seconds for any kind of key messages that you want to leave uh, either me or the audience with. So, so why not you and the audience? Because it, it's initiatives like this that spread the word. This isn't, your, this, this isn't to me, this is not PR, this is real. This is having a proper conversation. And I would say I'd leave ev all of us with one simple message. Look out for each other, look after each other. Look out for each other, look after each other. We create a better world, which is the definition of ESG. Fantastic. Rene, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Privileged to be on with you.